All right, so yesterday I got to look around our Twitter account and see what was going on. I saw some speakers doing some last minute beach time slide updating. I talked to some speakers. They hadn't updated any of their slides or looked at any of their slides. I talked to one speaker who freaked out that he thought his session was 30 minutes long <laughs> and didn't know what to do. And apparently instead of cutting down slides, he was adding more slides. <laughs> I'm not sure that really works out very well. But I did run into something special from our keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Patterson. So I was wondering what this meant and what we could really do about this. So I'm guessing he must really want spam or he's a really big fan of spam. So what, what, what's the situation here? Did you get to eat spam yet? Uh, yeah, I have some musubi. Oh, that, that's great because we have one for you right here. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so if you can come on up and I'll give you this spam musubi. Awesome. Thank you. And since yes. this is your time in Hawaii, you also have ah. LA. Thank you. Yes, spam. <laughs> This is Hawaii. We can't let you come here and not leave without spam. <laughs> All right. Who's ready for day one? <laughs> Who here wants me to get off stage and let this guy talk? <laughs> All right. Let's do that. OK, so I'm going to talk about Rails 4 and the future, or as I like to call it, Rails 4 for you and me. Uh, I was told, so I was told that you're not supposed to introduce yourself when you're giving keynotes, but I'm not very good at, at speaking, so um, I'm not going to tell you my name is Aaron Patterson, <laughs> and that if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can. So I'm just, for the record, I'm not telling you this stuff, okay? I'm not introducing myself. I just want to say hi to everyone. Uh, first, I got to start out and say uh, thanks to some people. Well. I got to say thanks to my employer, AT&T. Without them, I wouldn't be here, so thank you. Uh, I also want to thank the conference organizers for having a conference in a really awesome place. I've never been to Hawaii before. This is my first time, so I'm, I'm super excited. And the reason I'm really excited about it is because I love, I love spam. So <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, also, my, my favorite TV shows are here, like um, Dog the Bounty Hunter. I really, like, I was looking around for Dog the Bounty Hunter last night. I couldn't find him. Uh, and also, like, Magnum P.I. I love Magnum P.I., uh, as you can see by my mustache. <laughs> and if you don't believe me that I love Magnum P.I., you can see, like, I name my computers after Magnum P.I. characters. <laughs> um, so uh, and I wanted to tell you, I was, so I was flying down, you know, flying here to Hawaii, and... Uh, I had to go to the bathroom while I was on the plane, and the guy in the same row on my left also had to go to the bathroom. So he went, he went first, uh, and then he came back, and I went over to the bathroom. And I, I got there, and I looked out, and on the floor, there was, a, there was a $5 bill on the floor, like right in front of the bathroom. So I was like, well, he must have, he must have dropped this money. So I pick up the bill, go back to his seat, give him the money, and I'm like, hey, you must, you must have dropped this. So I go to the bathroom and uh, come back, and they're collecting donations on the aircraft for like breast cancer awareness. And if you donate money, then they enter you into a, into a raffle, and you can win like you can win some prizes on the airplane. So I sit down, and the guy says to me, he says, he, uh, "This isn't mine. I didn't drop this." And I was like, "Okay, well, it's not mine either." And he's like, "Why don't you donate it to the you know?" Why don't you donate it to the raffle thing? So I said, OK, that's, that's a great idea. Don't know whose money this is. We'll put it to a good cause. So I donate it, figuring, well, I'm not going to win any prizes. It's just going to get donated, so that'll be great. And then, of course, I win. <laughs> <laughs> and I was also the first one to choose the prize. Like, I could have chosen a bottle of champagne or like chocolates or all this stuff. And I didn't know what to do because it wasn't my money. <laughs> So I picked, I picked chocolates, but now I feel like there's an imbalance in the world. Like I have these illegal chocolates 
I shouldn't have them, so I don't know what to do with them, so I, I think I'm just going to eat them in my hotel room and not tell anybody that I want them. <laughs> but I guess it's too late now. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know if you can tell this, but I am insanely nervous on stage, and one of the things that I have to do to uh, comfort myself is uh, I, I told a friend of mine, well, I get super nervous, what should I do? I love speaking, but I'm so nervous on stage, what should I do about it? And he said to me, well, when you're on stage, you just need to think to yourself, what would Freddie Mercury do? So every time I give a talk, I put this up and I try to think to myself, what would Freddie Mercury do? Now, most speakers, like, most speakers think, well, the, it's common knowledge. Just imagine the entire, imagine the entire audience is in their underwear. Well, actually, for me, it's the opposite. I imagine that I'm on stage in my underwear. <laughs> I figure that's what Freddie Mercury would do. <laughs> anyway, um, I also want to tell you I have a cat, and his name is Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunderhorse. That's his full legal name. Uh, we call him, we call him Gorby Puff, though, and I love him a lot. Like, I love him a lot. And I thought, like, he's the first cat I've owned, and I thought, like, owning a cat, you know, it's going to be, like, 99% fun in the sun. We're going to go, like, riding bikes together, like, get ice cream, you know, swing in the, go swing in the park and do all this stuff. But it turns out that basically 99% of the time he's sleeping. So I try to take pictures of him, but the only pictures I can ever get are, like, him yawning. Like, he's about to go to sleep all the time. And it just kills me. I like. <laughs> so we never get to go bike riding together. But anyway, if you want to see more pictures of him yawning, you can follow him on Twitter. <laughs> so all right. So we're going to talk about Rails 4 for you and me. Uh, we're going to look at some features of Rails 4, and we're going to talk a little bit about the future of the web. Now. Uh, Despite my looks, I'm not a television psychic. <laughs> so I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen in the future, but I can talk about where I think it's going. And basically, the point of this talk is to get you guys, you know, get ideas flowing in, you know, among you guys, talk about where I think we're going, and then hopefully have you guys you know, pick up the ball and run with it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some behaviors in Ruby. And then we're going to look at some changes in Rails. Uh, and then we're going to look at how these changes in Rails interact with the web. So we're going to start pretty close to the server and then move our way out to the client. So the first thing I want to talk about is concurrency in Ruby uh, or parallelization. And I like, to, I like to shorten this down, but I'm not super good at spelling. So I, it's P56N. That's how I shorten it up. It's possibly misspelled. I'm not sure. Um, and I know most of you, most of you probably know about this or have at least, at least heard about this, that MRI has a gill or uh, what is known as a global interpreter lock. And this lock prevents uh, concurrent CPU execution. So what that means practically is that we can't schedule two threads on two, to run on two different CPUs at the same time. So if you want to have an interpreter that's able to do that, I suggest you look at alternatives such as JRuby or Rubinius. These are gill-free gill -free alternatives. Um, but I want to share some good news. And where is, where is Charlie? Is he here? No, he's not. Jerk. OK. Anyway, um, I want to share some good news with you. The gill was removed in 1.9. OK, so we can, be, we can be super happy about that. But um, I also want to share some bad news with you next, is that the gill was replaced with a GVL, <laughs> which is exactly the same thing. It just has a V instead of an I. <laughs> so if you go read the source code to 1.9, you'll see many references to GVL. And that's what that is. <laughs> so you know, this, this leads to the question, well, is MRI useless for P32N? And I mean, obviously, obviously, yes, it's useless. Uh, your programs don't actually work. It just seems like they work. 
I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know if there is really too much too much of a difference to be made. Like, if if your program seems like it's working, does that mean it's actually working? I think this is a question probably left for philosophers, people smarter than me. But um, anyway, let's. I want what I want to do is I want to take a look at the impact of the GVL on MRI and see like see what that means to us in our day-to-day -day Ruby basis. And the thing that I like to use for uh, looking at how the GVL impacts MRI is the use of the Fibonacci sequence. And the reason I like to do this is because I used to work in, um, I used to work in online advertising. I don't know if any of you guys have worked in online advertising, but online advertising is basically all about doing Fibonacci sequence calculations. So that's, like, that's how they decide what ads to show to you. So of course, <laughs> How many lies am I telling in this presentation? <laughs> uh, so of course I like to use this in all of my benchmarks because of online advertising. So all right, run this on my machine. Notice that says Higgins. <laughs> I'm, I'm not lying about the Magnum PI. <laughs> uh, I run this and it takes about 5.7 seconds on my machine. OK, so we're like, oh, this sucks. I need to be able to deliver ads faster. So I'm going to calculate my Fibonacci sequences in threads. So I've got, I've got four CPUs on my machine, so I'll throw up four threads here and calculate the Fibonacci sequence, uh, hopefully all of them in parallel. And then I run this, and it takes exactly the same amount of time, like just about the same amount of time. And the reason is because time spent in the VM can't be done in parallel. So hence, it's called a GVL, or global VM lock. So anytime, whenever we're spending time in the virtual machine, that can't be executed in parallel. So what do we do about this? Uh, things to fix this are people use JRuby or Rubinius if they want to actually have threads scheduled on multiple CPUs. But very common is what people will do is just use multiple processes. And this is what you're doing when you're running your Rails application with, say, like, Unicorn. Right? You're running a whole bunch of different Ruby processes so that you can actually handle concurrent requests on multiple CPUs on your machine. So it'll just run multiple, multiple Ruby processes. So I want to look at another thing, and this is, a, this is an example of using a slow, a slow web server or a slow web service. We have a slow web service here because, again, like basically online advertising is all about Fibonacci sequences and slow web services. Uh, so if you look at this, it's just super simple. It just prints out hello world. But the important thing is like we have a sleep here for half a second. So each request takes at least half a second to complete. And we run our client here. We have a client. And we just say, OK, well, go, you know, go fetch some data from the server. And we run this. And it takes a little over two seconds. And this makes sense because we have, we're doing four requests. Each at half a second takes two seconds. Not surprising. So. We're like, well, we forgot, we totally forgot about the previous thing, the previous knowledge about the GVL. Like, we've just, somehow we forgot about it, haven't had our coffee yet, so we decided to throw this into threads. And then we remember, oh, well, this isn't going to work out for us because, you know, we can't execute anything in parallel. So, what is the point of doing threads? Well, we run it anyway, but it actually takes half a second this time. So, we were able to execute this, make requests to this web service, even in MRI, using threads, and decrease the amount of time spent. Now, how did this work? Like, how did this work inside of Ruby? Well, there's different things, there's different methods inside of Ruby where we know, where the interpreter knows, well, OK, you know, nothing can actually happen inside of the Ruby VM while we're trying to read off of a socket. We can't actually execute anything right there. Right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to release the GVL, let other threads execute on the CPU while we're waiting for data off of the socket. And then once we actually get data on the socket, we're going to acquire the GVL again and enter back into the Ruby VM. So there's certain things that we can do this, we can do this trick with, which is like IO, any, any type of IO operations. And for those of you who are writing C extensions or 
looking into MRI's internals, the threat, the function you actually want to look for is this function, RB thread blocking region. Uh, this is the thing that actually unlocks the GVL. So you give it a you give it a function pointer, it'll unlock the GVL, call your function, execute some code, and then reacquire the GVL. And you can actually use this function when you're doing things like, for example, uh, cryptography, where you're doing things that are like CPU intensive, but you're never actually going to be in the uh, Ruby virtual machine. You're just doing computations in C. Then you can use this function as well. So. What does this mean? What does it mean that we can actually run things in parallel on MRI? Well, I mean, from an advertising perspective, obviously it means that we need to build Fibonacci as a service, or what I like to call FFAS, which is the next big thing. Yes. I'm looking for investors now, so come talk to me after. <laughs> I promise to use your VC wisely. <laughs> Um, uh, but really what it means is it, it means two things. It means that, number one, a blocked VM is a blocked VM. It's always a blocked VM. Blocked VM is a blocked VM. So if you find some library that's like, well, we're using fibers to make your stuff like super duper fast and in parallel, it's actually probably a lie. It's just adding complexity to your code. The VM can't actually magically switch out when you're using fibers. So the more important thing is that threads matter. If you're doing I.O. on MRI, threads matter. And I'm, I'm guessing like many of you, so I'm guessing many of you have web apps, probably, or at least some of your code does I.O., I'm guessing. <laughs> it would be nice if we didn't have to, but you know, so uh, even even on interpreters that have a GVL, using threads is important, and I think that web servers like threaded web servers like Puma are going to become more important because while we're doing I/O operations, we should be able to do to serve up CPU operations at the same time. So having solutions like uh, multi-threaded servers that are running in multi-process should become more popular, I would hope, or using gill-free solutions like JRuby with just a straight-up threaded server uh, would also do as well. So the next thing I want to talk about is thread safety in Rails. And uh, I'm going to talk about some of the changes that we've made in Rails to make it more thread safe. Uh, and what it means to you as developers, and what we had to do. I want to talk about common problems we ran into and uh, how you can fix those things in your applications. So the first thing that we did in Rails was uh, we deleted config.threadsafe. So we didn't actually remove it. It's, it's actually still there. It's just a no-op. So you can still call it, and it'll probably output a message saying something like, cool story, bro, you're already thread safe. <laughs> Uh, so the question is, well, why, why should we delete this? Why should we delete this configuration option? Like, what, what is the point of deleting this? Why do we want to delete this? Well, in, like, in my opinion, we should probably just always be writing programs that are thread safe. So if that's the case, then it boggles my mind why we would have some particular flag that's like, OK, now you should run thread safe. Or now you shouldn't run thread safe. And if you think about it, so does that mean, like, are there branches in the code where it's checking, OK, is it thread safe now? Are we thread safe? If we are, then let's do it in a thread safe manner. Otherwise, let's do it in a totally crazy manner that could blow up. It just doesn't, like, it just doesn't make sense to me. So it, this is my opinion why we, should remove, why we should remove this configuration flag is just because it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but the other thing is that it simplifies the Rails code base. So we can actually find those branches where we're saying, OK, well, now let's do this in a thread safe way, or let's not do this in a thread safe way, and we can eliminate those branches and actually simplify the code. So is it, is it safe to remove thread safe? It's the next question you might be asking. And in order to figure out the answer to this question, we need to understand, well, what did thread safe do? So let's take a look at that. 
what ThreadSafe did is it, it, it set these four different configuration options inside of Rails, and we'll look at what each of those are. Uh, but the first thing that I want to say is that uh, loading code isn't thread safe, and I put a star there because it's not actually true. Uh, require is now thread safe on trunk. I think require has been thread safe in JRuby for a while. I'm not totally sure about that. Uh, but the thing is, it doesn't actually matter because, well, I'm sure many of you have seen warnings that are like, uh, circular require is considered dangerous. You might have seen this. You might have seen this somewhere. And the problem with that is that, well, if we decide to take out a lock and do, this, do these requires, a circular require can lead to a deadlock, right? And we don't actually want to, like, it would not be very fun if when we're booting our Rails application, it just deadlocks. I wouldn't be too excited about that. <laughs> so in Rails, we just treat all code loading as not thread safe. And we say, OK, we're not going to do any, any sort of threading now. We're just going to load it all in the same thread, get it done. So configuration options. The first one, we enable preloading frameworks. And what this does is it says, OK, we're going to load all of Rails into, we're going to load up all of Rails. Now, I'm not sure, like, this Rails is typically lazy, lazily loaded if you don't have this set, which means, like, OK, I'm going to reference, when I reference Active Record Base, then it's actually going to load up Active Record. And it also does this for all of your code, so it won't actually load your model files until you actually reference that constant. And why the framework and your code is treated differently, I don't actually know why, but this is one of the configuration options is, OK, we'll do it this way. Uh, the next thing we do is we enable caching classes. This makes sense because, well, if we're going to load up all of our code, we don't want to be reloading. We know, if, we know that it's an axiom that loading code is not thread safe. So we don't want to be reloading code in production. That would not be a good thing. We lead to deadlocks. Our app dies. Not super excited about that. The next thing we, we do is we disable dependency loading. And this is the option that says, OK, when you reference a user constant, like an application constant, like your user model or whatever, we go load up that user model. So we disable that because we're hopefully preloading all of your code. So it doesn't make sense to go out and find these constants, because hopefully we've, we've already found them all. We're done. Now, the next thing, the next option is we enable concurrency. We allow concurrency. Um, this is my favorite option. Um, oh, and that was a lie, too. It's actually, I hate this option. <laughs> so what this option does is it actually removes a middleware called rack lock. What rack lock does is it wraps up your requests. So it says, OK, when a request comes in, we're going to obtain a lock. So thread one comes in, it gets a lock, it reads from the, so the, the socket, and we enter your Rails application and we try to process stuff. But let's say we have a second thread that comes along. It tries to obtain that lock, but thread one already has that lock taken out. right? So thread, thread two just sits there until thread one is done. It writes to the socket, releases its lock, and then thread two can say, OK, it's my turn. So it goes through the entire process and releases the lock finally. So with things like uh, multi-process setups, like if you're running Unicorn in production, uh, rack lock doesn't make any sense because you only have one thread in each process. You only have one thread processing a request, so what's the point of taking out a lock? If no other thread can acquire that lock, then what is the point of the middleware? So if you're using a multi-process setup, this simply just adds overhead to your application. So the other problem is that if you noticed in, that, in the way that we process requests there, it only allows one request at a time. So if you're running in a multi-threaded server, all of a sudden, you can only do one request at a time. So what is the point of running the multi-threaded server if you can only do one at a time? You boot this up. You boot up your server, and you're like, why is it only, why is it only running one request at a time? I guess I need to start up multiple processes of my threaded server. And you're like, why is this happening? Well, this is, the, this is why. So in the best case, it's extra overhead. This is our best case scenario with rack lock. <laughs> in our worst case, we can only process one request at a time. So 
I think that I think that options like this or default configurations like this is one of the reasons why nobody chooses thread safe servers. They start up their thread safe server and they're like, why I can only process one request at a time. This this web server sucks. I'm gonna move on to something else. So what is the impact of removing thread safe bang? We're just gonna say, all right, we're gonna enable this for everything. It doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. The impact is that boot time will probably increase. So boot time in production will probably increase because we're gonna preload all of your code. But the thing is, you actually had to pay all that time before, it's just that you paid it over the course of many, a few requests as your server warmed up. Now it just happens all up front. If you're a middleware, so you should have a slightly smaller stack size, maybe one or two stack frames. <laughs> But it is slightly smaller. Uh, Multi-proc servers should stay about the same. So after you boot up, you should see about the same uh, profile, like speed-wise. And threaded servers will just work. So now we don't have that anymore. Oh, that reminds me. Um, there was a there was a survey out that was like, who. Rails survey, like what web server do you use? You know, like, oh, who, is the, who has the most popular web server? And what I think is funny is that I don't think WebRick was listed anywhere in there. I don't know if you guys know what WebRick is, but it's the web server that comes with Ruby. Um, and if you don't specify the web server that you use when you deploy to Heroku, you use WebRick. I think many people don't know that. And the other interesting thing about WebRick is that it, it is a threaded web server. <laughs> so it's, I, I'm pretty sure it's like the first threaded Ruby web server. Anyway, so fun fact, that survey is probably wrong because I'm guessing there are many people who have pushed applications to Heroku without specifying a web server and they're using WebRick in production. Woo, WebRick. <laughs> Anyway, removing thread safe wasn't the only thing that we had to do to fix, or the only thing that we did in Rails to support um, threaded applications. We actually had to fix bugs where we were doing unsafe things. And what I want to do is look at some of the common scenarios where we were having bugs in Rails and what we had to do to fix them. And hopefully you can use this, look for these types of issues in your application too and fix threading, threading bugs in your Rails apps or your gems. Now, uh, I guess we're kind of lucky because 100% of our bugs were race conditions around caching. So we didn't actually have any deadlock situations, which was pretty nice. Um, so what we're gonna do is look at a few different uh, caching race conditions and what you have to do to fix them. So people don't seem to notice this, but or equals is a form of caching. So you're caching the right-hand side of the statement. You do some calculation. You do or equals, and it assigns it to some instance variable. We're lazily initializing that instance variable. And the way that this is a, the way that this is a problem is we say, OK, we have a check, then act race condition. The thread comes in and it says, OK, is that instance variable nil? If so, let's calculate it, set it, and return it. But the problem is while we're calculating that, while we're calculating that value, another thread could come along and be like, hey, is this instance variable nil? And it says, yes, it is nil. So now you have two different threads doing the same calculation twice. Now, one thing to note is that this particular operation is only dangerous when you're sharing it among threads. So if you see this happening, if you're sharing this data among threads, that's really where you have to worry about it. And what you can do is you can eagerly initialize it. And of course, I'm using Fibonacci sequence here. As I said, Fibonacci sequence, very important. Uh, we eagerly initialize this, this instant variable on the class. And we know that booting, up, booting the application and requiring files is considered to be not thread safe, so we're guaranteed that this is only gonna happen inside of one thread. So we pre-calculate this cache, store it on the class, and then we're good to go. The other fix that we can do is we can lock. So this requires that we add a mutex, and we say, okay, we're gonna go synchronize on that mutex 
calculate the Fibonacci sequence and then return it. So the other thing that we can do is we can move this to instance methods. Class methods are going to be shared among threads. So depending on the particular problem that you're trying to solve, moving to an instance method may be a better, may be a better solution. So you say, well, I'm not going to share this instance among threads. We can actually generate a new instance per thread, and we just do the calculation in our initialize, and we have a cache there. We can also do a lazy initialization if we want to using a synchronized block and initializing there. Now, if you really, really, really need this to be a class method, another thing that you can do is create a singleton, store that, on, store that as a constant, and use that. And actually, we found that to be fairly handy throughout the uh, Rails source because we can actually instantiate that object and test it. So dealing with singletons is kind of a pain because maybe if they store any type of state, you have to reset that and it's just much easier to test against an instance of something. Now, the, another problem that we ran into was hash.new blocks, and this is, this is kind of an insidious problem because you don't notice at the method level that, well, this isn't gonna be thread safe. You just look at the method and you're like, well, I'm pulling a, I'm pulling a value out of the hash. It's totally fine, it's gotta be fine. But actually what's happening is the hash is doing the same, the same issue that we had in the or equals the or equals section. It's saying, okay, we have to check, then act. Do we have this key? If we don't have the key, then we need to go calculate a value for it. One thing that we can do is synchronize around, synchronize around key fetching. Uh, the other thing that you can do is, which I recommend is getting this thread safe gem from uh, Charles. And I, like, I have to say, uh, I wish that the type of stuff that Charles has in this gem was in Ruby's standard library because I feel like that's another problem with um, thread safety in Ruby itself is we don't have a lot of the primitives available to us in the standard library like thread safe hashes, thread safe arrays, uh, even some things like, I don't know, futures, latches, barriers, those types of those types of concurrency data structures just aren't available to us in the standard library. So I feel that that is something that's keeping Ruby developers from writing thread safe code. So this is well and great, but what about at the app level? Like, I'm talking about all of this stuff from the perspective of somebody working on the framework itself, and I suspect most people are actually working on Rails applications, so what do we do at the Rails app level? Well, the answer is actually very easy. It's actually really easy, and you shouldn't be afraid of making your, your code thread safe. The main thing you need to do is avoid shared data. Once you learn how to spot where shared data is happening in your application, it's actually pretty easy to eliminate that or put locks around it. And the reason I say that this is the most important thing you need to remember is because most people don't actually type thread.new in their applications. It's very rare. So if you're not actually spinning, spooling up new threads, then mostly what you need to do is watch out for shared data, and you need to look for things that are global. We're gonna look at a few things that are global, like this, obviously if you're using global variables, it is a global and probably shared among threads. Another global that you need to watch out for are constants. Constants are gonna be shared among threads. What's kind of annoying is if you, do, if you set the constant twice, you're gonna get a warning, Ruby will complain to you, but you can actually uh, mutate a constant value like down here on the bottom and you won't get a warning about that. You're modifying global data, but you don't know. And I think the one, the one that's most common are class level methods, class methods like this. You have to remember that all these classes, these classes are all shared among threads and when you set a method on that class, that method is also shared among all of your threads. So you need to be careful about these. So like I said, avoid, avoid global data add and add locks. The next thing I want to talk about is streaming. And to be honest, this isn't um, a new feature in Rails 4. It's actually, we just tried to make it easier to use. So we're going to look at, we'll look at streaming and then we'll look at uh, template rendering, how template rendering works today. We'll look at streaming and we'll look at uh, some features beyond Rails 4. So I want to look at template rendering from a high level, a high, very, very high level perspective. 
When we process our ERB templates, the results are buffered and stored into memory. And as such, all the Rails internals are built around buffering up this template and then spitting it out to the socket, spitting it out to the client. Now, what sucks about this is it means that clients are blocked while Rails is working. So when somebody makes a request to your web server, they say, give me the index page. And Rails is like, OK, we're going to calculate the index page. And it's sitting there churning away, calculating the index page, while the client is just sitting there going, OK, when am I going to get some data? When am I going to get some data? When you could be sending data down to the client and letting them fetch like assets or process JavaScript in advance. So the client is blocked while Rails is working. The other annoying thing about the way that template processing is handled is that we have to fit the entire, mem or the entire page into memory before we spit it out to the client. Usually this is fine, but it means that we're constantly resizing strings, and we'll see the process growing as it, as it um, builds up the page, and then hopefully reducing again, hopefully, and then spitting out to the client. So most people expect that they uh, have to return something from Rack here. They have to return the entire page. And I think Rack encourages buffering. If you look at the Rack API, this is a Rack application. Uh, the, that third parameter in the array is actually the page buffer itself. And the simplicity, simplicity of this API makes it seem like, well, I have, to, I have to buffer up the entire page before I send it off to, I send it off to the client, because we have to actually return this value up the stack. So, the thing that's annoying about this is we know that even in MRI, even in MRI, we can do I.O. and CPU in parallel. So why are we buffering up this page? What is the point of buffering it up? We could be sending data down to the client, actually getting some parallelization P37N out of this. So this is where Action Controller Live comes in. And what this is is a module that you mix into your controller, and it gives you an I.O. type an I.O.-like API to send data down to the client. And here's an example. The, the, reason we, the reason we stick with this module is because today people are expecting that everything gets buffered, and we don't want to break that assumption in Rails 4. We don't want to break your applications when you're upgrading, so this is an opt-in feature. So here's an example of using it. You just mix in Action Controller Live, and then you get this stream object on your response object that you can write to. It acts like an I.O. That means you have to close it like an I.O. It acts like an I.O. So it's natural for us to do computations with I.O.s. So Action Controller Live gives you an object that quacks like an I.O. This I.O. API is important to me because on Unix systems, everything is a file. Everything is a file. So why aren't we treating our output like a file as well? So I want to look at how this works. How does it work? We're going to look at some of the internals and how to actually build this. So this is the API we want. We want something where we set the status, we set some headers, and we write out to our stream, and then we close it. That's what we want to, ideally, that's what we would have our API look like. Now, the problem is if we look at the Rack API, uh, we, don't, we don't have that with the Rack API, so how can we accomplish this? X whatever equals heart. <laughs> Well, what we need to do is we need to wrap this up into a response object and have people write to it. Right. So we, we wrap it up in a response object, and it looks like this. Like, here's our response. But the problem is, you know, down there at the bottom, that's our rack application. Sets the response on the controller, and then it calls the index, and then returns back up the stack. But the problem is that this still doesn't stream. This doesn't solve our problem. We're calling into the controller, waiting for the controller to return, and then returning back up the stack. So how do we fix this? Like, what do we do? Well, we can call the action inside a thread. Ah, now we're seeing why thread safety in Rails is important. We can call the action inside of a thread, and then return back up the stack outside of that thread. But this still isn't good enough, because if you're looking at this carefully, you're saying to yourself, well, oh, man, this could return back up the stack before anything has actually happened inside the controller. Maybe nobody's set the response status. Maybe nobody set the headers. What are we going to do? So how do we deal with this? Ideally, what we want to do is we want to wait. Right here, we'll say, OK, we're going to wait on the stream. We'll wait until something has actually been written. 
And the way that we do this is we have a buffer class, and this buffer class has a latch in it, and we, we call a wait on the buffer class, and that just blocks there until somebody is actually written. And you'll see down here in the write method, that releases the latch, and then we return back up the stack. OK, cool. So there is our, there is our internal implementation. And this is an exact code, but it's very similar inside the Rails source code. So you can go look for this, and it should seem familiar. So cool, but what can we do with this? What can we do with this streaming stuff? Well, I want to say like this really excites me from a Rails internals perspective, because we can use this to build streaming ERB. We already have streaming ERB, but this greatly simplifies the process. And we can see this by taking a look at how ERB does processing. So here we have an ERB template. We output the source. And this is what the actual source of the ERB template is. So we see that it can catch a bunch of stuff. Uh, but what's cool is that we can, control, we can control the way that ERB writes things out, and we can control the variable that it writes to. So in this example, what we're doing is we're saying, OK, I want you to use the write method, and I want you to call the write method on standard out. So now if we take a look at the template source, we're actually writing to standard out. This is awesome because we can refactor Rails internals to more easily produce streamed template output. This is the result of that, that template. So how is this cool in web? Like, that's awesome for Rails internals, but how is this cool for web applications? Refactoring Rails internals excites me, but maybe it doesn't excite you guys very much. So let's take a look at how we can use this with web applications. One thing we can do is we can build infinite stream API server similar to Twitter. Uh, but I don't actually think that's ex as exciting as the other things that we can do with this. The most interesting thing to me now is using server sent events. Now, I don't know if you've seen server sent events, but they're basically infinite streams where the browsers will, will fire a JavaScript function every time it sees an, an event. There's a JavaScript API. So this is, this is what an SSC response looks like. It has this content type of text event stream. And every time the browser receives a particular event, like this one, it'll fire a JavaScript function and pass this data payload to that JavaScript function. So this is the source. Uh, this is the JavaScript source to set up uh, an SSE. And you can see here that this actually makes the request back to your server. So it calls, it makes a request to slash control on the server, and it actually keeps that socket open. Now, we add an event listener on the reload event. So every time we get an event named reload, the browser will execute a JavaScript function, and we can have the JavaScript function do whatever we want to. And in this particular instance, I'm having it just reload the, reload the page. And I think this is cool because we can have uh, the server notify the browser about events and actually have real-time browser communication. So I want to show a video of an example of this. We execute, fire up our server, load the page, woo, users, yay. And every time we change a file, we can actually have that notify the server. So we'll change it to say, what do I say, OMG, I think. And it'll actually notify the browser, hey, you need to do a reload. It's time to do a reload. We can have it watch assets, too. So if you change your CSS, it'll automatically do reloads. Change it down there. We can see the user's, user's background has changed. Delete it, and it'll go away. And the other cool thing is we can do it from other processes, too. So we can say, well, let's fire up the Rails console, and we're going to modify the database. We'll create a user here. And as soon as we create the user, it notifies the browser, hey, data change, you need to reload or do whatever you want to, whatever we define that JavaScript function to do. So how does this work? When the file system changes, we use FS events. And when the file system changes, the file system notifies, notifies our web server saying, hey, this FS events gem says, hey, something changed. You need to do something. And then our web server says, OK, cool. We're going to send an event down on this control socket that we have with the browser. And then the browser does its thing and reloads. Now, what's interesting is that all these, all these three boxes are actually within the same process. These are all running within um, our web server. So yes, all these three boxes are in the same process. Now, the way that it works with the console that we were looking at, that console example, is a little bit more tricky. 
we actually fire up a DRB server inside of your web server, and it opens up a socket, and the console opens up a socket to our DRB server saying, hey, and across that, that socket, we can send events to the server and have those send it down to the client. So other possible input sources besides you know, file system changing or database changing to get your mind churning are we can, we can use embedded systems. For example, I have my meat curing box hooked up to a web server. Uh, we can use it with telephony or maybe other users, for example, chat systems. Like, we could use this to build, say, oh, I don't know, IRC, or something like that. So we looked at these three topics, and P72N, parallelization, thread safety, parallelization, and streaming. And uh, Hopefully, I was able to relate them all to each other. So you can see how each of these are related inside of your applications as well as inside of Rails internals. Now, I think, I think that cores are increasing. I don't think that this is a, a stretch to say that every time you buy new machines, the cores are increasing on your new machine. Like, I just bought a MacBook Air and a new MacBook Air, and now I'm up to four cores, and that's crazy. It's really awesome. But the thing is, we need to start utilizing the entire machine. Which is why investigating things like uh, doing parallelization with our virtual machines is so important. We need to understand how we can make the most of these machines. The other thing that I think is changing is we have high latency clients. We're starting to get more and more high latency clients, like people who are out on their really terrible edge server or edge connections on their cell phones. And we need to get data down to these clients as quickly as possible. Having them wait on our server to process templates is unacceptable. We should be getting data down to them as soon as possible. The other thing that I think is changing is that patience is decreasing. And I mean this among people. Like, I think, I think everybody's patience is decreasing. And personally, I blame this on Honey Boo Boo. Um, <laughs> but I think that people are expecting, like, they're becoming, they're starting to expect more instantaneous responses from their web servers. And we need to figure out how to do this. And I think the way that we need to do this, I was thinking about this, the way that we need to do this is we need to lie. <laughs> when somebody is asking for a particular calculation, we should be using cache data where we can. We're not actually performing that calculation. We're caching it. We're lying to you about it. We need to cheat. So updating partial pages, partials on the page. We don't update the whole thing. You do a request, we're only going to update the part of the page that changed. So we're cheating. We're not actually re returning the entire page. And we also need to steal. And I mean steal computation from our end users. So moving, moving calculations into JavaScript and having those calculated on the, on the uh, client side. So for the future, what I want all of you to do, I want you all to lie, cheat, and steal. <laughs> In other words, I want you all to be good engineers. Thank you. <laughs> if you have questions about this, please come see me after. I don't know if we have time for questions. And I'm not sure what the protocol is on questions here. But if we have time, I'm happy to take them. If we don't, come find me. So thank you. Do we have time for questions? Are we going to do that? Oh, OK. Five minutes. Questions. Go. And go. <laughs> so I was wondering, if we don't have questions, I was wondering, like, so are there, like, boutique spam places here in Hawaii? <laughs> like, is there, the, I want to try, I want to see if I can find some, like, organic, shade-grown, fair trade spam and, like, <laughs> try that? Does that exist? Is it a thing? Deep fried spam. Deep fried spam? Ooh, that sounds delicious. <laughs> questions, questions. Anyone? Yes, Constantine. Uh, so the question is, in template streaming, how do you handle, how do you handle uh, exceptions that happen during uh, streaming? And the answer is, uh, don't have any exceptions. <laughs> no, um, so there's, there's things we can do, like 
spit out JavaScript to redirect you or some, some kind of hacks, but really they're total hacks. I don't have a good answer for you. Total hacks. <laughs> yes, Anything Kobe. Anything on uh, timing with the release candidates in Rails 4? Uh, timing, the question is about timing on the release candidates of Rails 4. Um, any dates that I give you are going to be total crap. Uh, we thought we would have a beta out at the beginning of September, and obviously it's past September, but um, I think we're mostly unblocked now. <laughs> we're hoping to get a beta out shortly and a final before the end of the year, like so soon-ish. Yes? Uh, the question is, is there a way to take advantage of the new queue system um, right now? And let's see, uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, because, yes, because it's basically just a queuing API. And really, like the only thing that's really in Rails to support that is a fancy hash, where you set a queue type object. So if you get, um, I think, Rescue has, well, OK. If you're using, if an in-memory queue is good enough for you, then just use the queue, queue object. If you need something that's serialized, say like Redis, um, Jeremy Kemper is working on a queue, queuing API for Rescue that wraps around Rescue, and you can use it. Um, I'm not sure if you can use that today, but it will be out along with Rails 4. Um, Sidekick has a queuing API, but it's on an experimental branch. so. If you want to use it today, um, tweet at me, and I will help you get set up. How's that? Uh, yes? Yes, so people who work with jQuery know about futures, but um, can I talk about latches and barriers for a second? Yes, uh, latch, all a latch does is say, it allows you to coordinate, coordinate two different threads. You're basically saying, well, one thread, you share the latch among multiple threads, and you say, well, OK, uh, I want this thread to go to sleep until this other thread has done some particular calculation. When that other thread is finished with its particular calculation, it'll unlock, it'll unlock the latch and let the, other thread, let the other thread go. And typically, you use like a countdown latch or something like that. So you say, like, well, um, I need five different threads to finish their job before I'm going to continue. So it'll just count down on each of those. And then um, barrier is, I believe a barrier is basically the same thing, except that you can also do cyclic barriers. So basically reuse your latch. The thing, the thing about latches is that they're one-time use. So you can't reuse it. But if you have a cyclic barrier, you can reset it. Questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, so the question is, let me see. Let me see if I'm getting this right. Uh, is there going to be a plan for standardizing SSEs inside of Rails? Is that Uh, so giving you giving you like a default when you start up when you first get started for using SSE. So the question is, is there going to be a, like some sort of default for people to be able to use SSEs when they fire up their web applications? Uh, the answer is there's no there's no plan for that right now, um, and it's also it's kind of hard because it's kind of hard to do something like that because right now like. Action Controller Live doing streaming as an opt-in thing. It's not default for all of your. It's not default for all of your controllers. My personal plan is I would actually like to make that default. I'd like to refactor the the Rails internal <laughs> such that we're always using streams. And I think once we get to that point, then it would make sense to say like, okay, we're going to give you easy, sane defaults for doing SSEs. But right now, it's like it's total DIY basically. So if somebody did a, I think what would really help, and what I, I've been, 
I'm, I'm going to admit I'm a really terrible person. I've been copying and pasting this stupid little I.O. object around between all of my applications that just spits out SSEs, so I write an object to it and it translates that into a JSON object that's spit out as an SSE. Probably somebody should write a gem for that. Hint, not me. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Yes. Okay. Do we have time? Anything else? Last question. Are you going to come to the Spam Jam Festival next summer? Am I going to come to the Spam Jam Festival yeah. next summer? I didn't know there was one. <laughs> That's awesome. If I'm not somewhere else, yeah, totally. <laughs> Does anyone else like Spam? Am I the only one? <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you.